Markets across the world have been characterized by volatility over the past quarter. Having said that, emerging markets have done pretty well this year. Uh, there have been concerns about the slowing in the US economy and the disappointing macro picture in China. And we've also had uncertainties in Japan amid a rising interest rate policy. And now as we enter the fourth quarter, we've just had the first Fed rate cut in more than four years. Sean, why don't we get right into that? Is it what you were expecting? And do you expect the Fed to cut again this year? I think the underlying trend has actually been the, the growth in the US economy. The, there's probably been better than expected. The interesting thing is, is the reaction in the market. So equities came down a little bit. Um, on, you know, the, the 10 year actually went up a little bit. And so I would say then it's been a mixed reaction in the market. So our view is we've got two more rate cuts to the end of the year. Um, I mean, if the, if the data is weaker, we could have 50 in November and then 25 in December. And we then should then have rate cuts all the way through to June 2025, where the, where the rate would then be in the range of 3.25 to 3.5. Uh, now, how many of these cuts and future rate cuts we may get over 1% by the end of the year uh, impact the performance of emerging markets, uh, particularly the regions, Asia, Asia and Latin America? And how will it affect your portfolio allocations and positioning? So in this case, you know, our base case is that the US economy is actually in pretty good shape. I mean, the Fed are talking about 2% growth this year, 2% growth next year. Um, it's probably actually stronger than the European economy and the Japanese economy. So you can't say at the moment that global growth is stronger than the US growth going forward, despite the rate cuts. Um, but within emerging markets, and particularly the rate sensitive markets, it gives the ability of a number of central banks to cut rates. And I expect we'll see about eight to 10 central banks cutting rates. So this is really is a turning point for Asia. But it won't be, it's not a big one-off, it will be incremental. So, you know, we're still a big believer that Asian growth is picking up. Pre-COVID, it's much more normalized cycle than it is in the US because the demand wasn't, aggregate demand wasn't held by fiscal policy and handouts. Um, and this rate cutting, gradual rate cutting really does help over the next year. So positioning wise, we've already pre-positioned. So a lot of the regional funds, we've already taken some capital out of the markets that have done very well in North Asia, particularly in the tech area. And we've put more money into areas that are very rate sensitive, like ASEAN region. Any sectors globally uh, that you think may benefit from this uh, rate new uh, macro rate cutting regime? Financials in ASEAN, definitely. Um, we're not ready yet to buy deep cyclicals in terms of commodities. That's always traditionally been um, a play on interest rates, but that's more to do with the weakness in China growth. Um, and then the other complicated area is normally in this cycle, we'd be buying what I would call you know, cyclicals in tech in Taiwan and Korea. But because of the AI theme, then they have already run quite hard. So we're a bit more selective there. So really the theme is domestic economies as opposed to, you know, as opposed to um, more US driven technology. Dig a little deeper and highlight the performance of some key markets and regions and unpack their performance as it relates to their economies a little bit. Um, so perhaps we can start with India. You know, the equity, this equity market is up over 20% year to date. We've got projections for double digit growth for the next couple of years. Capital inflows will likely continue. Investors can't ignore India, right? I think the way we like to look at it is that India is changing. The growth is really there. It's sustainable. It's widening out. And so those stocks that might have done, those sectors that might have done well when India was not doing well, that were managing, that were better run than most companies that were winning market share in a bad market, they're probably not the stocks or sectors you want to buy now. 
And the sectors have really widened out. The market's really widened out. And that's, you know, those, those newer areas are probably the areas that people want to invest more in. So you've got incredible growth rates coming out of, of these areas as they adjust or benefit from the changes in the economy, the broadening out of the economy. Um, look, valuations do worry us, um, as do fund flows. I mean, the market has been driven incredibly by domestic flows, you know, which you know, years ago built up to say a billion dollars a month of flows coming in, and now it's multiples of that. And so, you know, the real the real risk in India is that these domestic flows stop. You know, money comes out domestically. Um, but for us, the growth story is very firm. You know, we're positive on the government, we're positive on the plan. You know, the growth story will continue to evolve and widen out. And so any correction from fund flows, we would see as a good long-term buying opportunity. So our real focus is to find those companies that have those business models or benefit from the environment that can really have that, you know, either mark either market growth or above market growth and just be a bit more cautious there. Let's get on to uh, Japan. So we've had a lot of macro related volatility and that seems to be the main narrative of late, but Japan has done well this year. Do, you know, do macro headwinds matter for long term investors in, China, in Japan? But overall, Japan still is driven by macro at a very short term basis. So, you know, we've had a couple of issues this year with the sensitivity to the yen. One, when the yen weakened too much, then when the yen strengthened too much. You know, one of the, it's the only developed market central bank that's wanting to tighten policy. Um, might find it more difficult now the Fed's done 50 basis points there to tighten. Um, and, um, but, you know, that is something that is still apparent there. Um, the, 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 the stock market earnings are less sensitive to currency moves because the companies are better run. Um, but the macro does, does affect things. But it also gives entry points for investors to add to what we think is truly a good long-term story. And, and the story, Ben, is based still on earnings and you know, capital market reform, corporate governance reform, which is leading to better earnings. So if you can select those companies with better earnings than the market, you, know, you, can, you can create some good alpha. Let's move on to China. China's difficulties are well documented um, and the news doesn't seem to be improving uh, as we get further into the year. Can you put into perspective briefly, you know, the challenges that China faces and can you give a sense of whether you see these challenges getting worse before they get better? I think it's going to be a tricky, a tricky, a tricky environment there, um, even though the PE looks on paper good. Um, it's probably with earnings downgrades, you know, a bit more expensive um, there. But on the other hand, it's uncorrelated. Some stocks that have got good earnings are still find their way into portfolios. Um, you know, China could benefit from rates coming down because it eases the pressure on the monetary side of China. They can then cut rates without being worried about the currency. Actually, the currency has been fairly, fairly strong. Um, but we do have an election coming up, and I don't expect to see any big you know, news coming out of the Chinese government while you have that uncertainty of the election. E-commerce, you know, internet platforms have, have, been the com have been the area where we've seen the most positive news. And also in insurance as well, actually. Um, and these valuations are, are very, very cheap. Um, now, there is a question, can, if the overall environment continues to get worse and worse, can these companies continue to produce better earnings? You know, um, but at the moment, I think you know, their balance sheet is very strong. We've got a lot of cash on their balance sheet, um, a lot of cash on their market, market cap, and they've been able to buy back shares. They've been able to cut costs um, there, and I, I expect they can continue to do that for, for a couple of quarters. Um, the areas where you're... You know, you're seeing a pickup, um, sorry, disappointment is, is more on the property side. Um, and financials are okay. You're seeing a little bit of weakness there, um, but that's not to be expected, uh, not to be unexpected. 
given given the economy, but they they're pretty 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 steady. Um, but the consumer is the worrying one, you know. Really, in consumer companies, we're seeing, you know, you know, margins coming down. You know, more more sort of prepared to cut prices and, and hurt their margins and keep their volumes. Um, and that's an area which I think will take a bit a bit longer. Really. How would you summarise the drivers of growth? Well, I mentioned Mark's actually done, and Asia done pretty well this year, considering a lot of the headwinds. And I think that's really down then to two things. One, the US economy has been better than expected. And two, emerging markets in Asia are actually better run. You know, you look at the balance sheets, you look at the sovereign wealth, the sorry, sovereign rate ratings, they're better. Um, but what's been lacking has been earnings growth, and we're beginning to see that come through. Um, we do expect volatility for the next couple of months, given the election. But the long, you know, the net, the medium term, you know, view is that growth is picking up. That's coming through to earnings. Valuations are reasonably cheap, and you know, equities are looking attractive relative to fixed income at this level, um, and that should be positive for, for markets. Secondly, we're seeing more broader opportunities. It's not just about India or you know. Or well, China, it's actually ASEAN, selective opportunities in Latin, you know, India still doing well, selective opportunities in Korea and, and Taiwan, although as they're going through a little bit of a, a D rating, but that will give us good opportunities and selective opportunities in China. Many investors are rightly concerned about emerging market performance in recent years, but we know that when emerging markets recover, the shift can be sudden, it can be unexpected. So investors have got this conundrum in a way, that they're under allocated, and yet they perhaps have a fear of missing the rebound. How would you counsel them on this, on the potential for this rebound? Um, and, you know, it being unexpected and then being underinvested at the moment. I, th I think it's always important to have diversified portfolios. I mean, I think that, you know, investors who have done incredibly well in the US over the years should diversify out and look at areas like Japan, like India, like emerging markets and like Asia. And, and think of it as a three to five year investment. You know, it's really difficult to time, particularly with an election and an interest rate cycle going on. Um, but, you know, underlying all these geopolitical issues that we've had this year has been actually pretty good growth coming through. Not as good as the US, um, but challenging. You know, India's up as much as more than the NASDAQ this year, you know, et cetera. Um, Taiwan at one point was as well. So, you know, my view is to increase allocations to emerging markets in Asia um, and Japan for diversification. And I think that will give you a much better you know, reward risk portfolio over the next few years.